just want to spend a few moments uh, sharing with you um, the story of ImageNet and also where we go from here. And I want to particularly emphasize that I want to share with you the human story because uh, we can read about ImageNet as a piece of academic research work, but there's a lot of um, humans behind this. And, and at the end of the day, as I always share with my students, there's nothing artificial about artificial intelligence. It's, uh, it's uh, made by humans, uh, intended to work with humans, and it will have the impact for humans. Um, I want to begin with where did ImageNet come from? Um, because I often get asked this question. Um, let me ask you a question. Just This is not a trick question, but I'm curious. What does, if I say the year 540 40 million years ago, what does that mean for you? Anybody know any significance of that, that number? Okay. Um, I have one of my own PhD student in the audience, you should know, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> other than that, uh, I do, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, good, you pass. Um, okay, so that is the onset of what evolutionary biologists call the big bang of evolution, Cambria explosion. So that is, at that time, Earth was mostly watery, and there were very simple animals floating in the water in the shapes of trilobites and so on. And they really just float, and then when some smaller animal comes by, they take a bite. Life was very chill. And then something really weird happened. Within 10 million years, so from 540 million years to 530 million years, evolutionarily speaking, it's very, very narrow window the number of animal species just exploded. Like you can see a big jump in the kind of animals in the fossil studies. And for a long time, nobody knew why. Was it a meteorite strike? Was it a change of chemical balance in the water? Was some changes to Pretty recently, probably a decade or so ago, uh, through a lot of uh, fossil studies and, and, and piecing together the puzzle, one theory became very prominent and quite accepted now in the field of evolutionary uh, biology to, to, to pin down the reason. And here we're in a photo a photography gallery, and the reason is vision happened. And that's when the first animals, speaking figuratively, developed a tiny pinhole in their, I wouldn't even call it head, but in their body. And that pinhole changed the entire trajectory of evolution because animals start to see the world. Before that, animals were just lying there passive, not sensing the world and food comes by, take a bite. Now, life is active. And once life is active, the evolutionary arms race started. Some animals become dinner, and other, <laughs> other animals want to go out and seek for dinner. So the prey and predators start to differentiate, and that evolutionary pressure of the onset of vision and perception really drove animals' uh, speciation forward. And the rest of this history uh, brings us to 540 million years later. Here we are, humans are the most intelligent animal that our nature has produced, and half of our brain are involved in visual processing. This is vision is by far the most ancient and also important sensory system in our brain. You know, nature is very, very um, smart. It doesn't use this precious real estate uh, for nothing, right? It, why is half of our brain devoted, uh, involved in the visual <coughs> process? There are two really important reasons. One is that vision is important. It enables animal and intelligent animal to survive, to navigate, to manipulate, to communicate, to understand, to, to you know, do what we do. Second is vision is hard. 
it, mathematically, this is a really hard problem um, nature had to solve for us and eventually computers had to solve, is that you take a 3D complex world and project it into a 2D imagery or two 2D imageries, depending on how many eyes we have for different animals. And then you have to somehow infer the real world out there with the important information that enables you to do whatever, um, whatever um, you need to. So, um, so about 60 years ago, or maybe 70, I'm trying to count in my head, that um, the most famed British uh, mathematician, computer scientist, Alan Turin, um, challenged humanity with this audacious question, can machines think? And then a few, a few uh, years later, a group of pioneering, mostly American computer scientists started to really ask the question, can we formulate thinking machines? And one of the most famous moments was the Dartmouth uh, summer where founding fathers of artificial intelligence like Marvin Minsky from MIT and uh, uh, John McCarthy eventually from Stanford got together and started to putting down the first initial ideas of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence or of AI. They even coined the term AI at that time. Um, some people say it's a bless and a curse that we call this AI because it has a lot of human and, um, implications. So just around the time AI was born, very importantly, the field of computer vision is born because um, <laughs> the ability to be visually intelligent is goes so hand in hand with the ability of making intelligent machines. We cannot think of truly an int eventual intelligent machine that does not um, at least encompass some of the most foundational in uh, intelligence of, of humans, such as vision. So the field of vision um, started and uh, but between the, the late 50s all the way to, I would say, um, the late 90s, um, the field of AI, including vision, was in the exploratory mode. On one hand, we have mathematical developments such as machine learning starting to uh, take place. And some of the, uh, how many of you have heard of the word neural network? Raise your hand, I just want to make sure. Okay, so many of you. Um, um, the, including neural, ne neural network algorithms started to get invented in the 60s and 70s and, and, and all that. That was the mathematical tools, you know, we, the field was dabbling with different kinds of uh, tools. Um, um, and as just next to that, the field of computer vision was also exploring different tasks. Is um, What is computer vision? What do we want computers to do to see? And it take a while. At the beginning, people were matching satellite images as a computer vision task, or recognizing digits as a computer vision task, or trying to stitch stereo images so we can reconstruct the geometry of the 3D world as a computer vision task. These are all important tasks. But the field lacked a North Star. And the North Star is a scientific quest that is so far out there, but it will define important milestones of what we want to achieve in computer vision. So luckily, I entered the field of computer vision in the year of 2000. I, I dabbled in it as undergrad, but I entered my PhD in 2000. Uh, I say luckily because leading up to 2000, there's a really important sister field that prepared us for what we are about to do. Without that field, us computer vision scientists wouldn't be where we are today. And that field is cognitive neuroscience. And throughout the past, um, leading up to 2000, the past three decades, um, vision scientists in psychology, in neuroscience, in neurophysiology are finding really interesting um, phenomena of the visual, um, of humans' visual intelligence. For example, they found 
Now, uh, like what Nicola is trying to replicate, it's, the humans are incredibly fast at recognizing objects. They found we don't need much attention to see objects if they are ecologically natural, meaning that we'll see tigers really fast, we'll see dogs really fast, we'll see um, um, an apple really fast. But if you ask me to read letters, it'll take a long time or shapes, uh, uh, geometric shapes, it'll take a long time. They also found that in our brain, there are areas that are devoted to objects. For example, hidden inside, you have to connect the two ears and then go down around here. There's a little area called fusiform face area, FFA, that is devoted for face recognition. And then somewhere else, more on the lateral side, there's an area that's devoted for body parts. A little deeper down, there's an area that's devoted for space and rooms and, and 3D places. So these findings coming all together really helped computer vision at the turn of the century to define one of the most important North Star, which is object recognition. And I was very lucky, my PhD advisor Pietro Perona, very charming Italian guy at Caltech, was at the forefront of this quest. We entered, I entered PhD, and he wanted me to research on, on, on this task of object recognition. He, he um, inspired me to think that is, unlike the other computer vision problems we've been dabbling on as a field, this is one of the most important problems because it's foundational to human visual intelligence. And then this brings me to England. Um, my second year of PhD, I wasn't making much progress, so I need a scenery change. And I came to Oxford uh, to, to visit for, for three, um, uh, three months. And Pietro and I were still struggling with this problem of object recognition. And one of the most difficult struggles is there's no data. You know, I mean, think about it. At that time, digital camera just happened, just got commercialized. I remember Pietro's first camera we bought for the lab was like $6,000, a Canon. So it was very expensive and we didn't have data. So literally my first project I started to do as a computer vision PhD student here in England was called one shot learning of objects because we want to use one or two or three pictures to recognize objects because we don't have many pictures out there and internet barely happened. Google was founded in 1999 I think so we're talking about 2001 2002 right like search engine barely happened so um, that was fine it was a successful PhD project measured by I published a paper. And um, I went back to Caltech. And in a short period of time, between 2000, and then I started to advance in my PhD, I continued to dabble on the problem, to research on the problem of object recognition. And between 2000, and by 2005, I graduated. And the field of computer vision is very, very, focus now on the problem of computer vision and a group of researchers in England again became a pioneering group of researchers who proposed a data set called Pascal VOC. I don't know how many of you have heard of that data set. Okay, good. I'm glad because uh, we really have to pay tribute to, um, to um, uh, researchers in UK uh, from Cambridge to Edinburgh to Oxford I think there's also one from Netherlands, actually. <laughs> um, they put together a data set about 10,000 pictures and 20 classes of objects. Because it's from England, there are lots of cows in, um, in, a, in a nice um, meadow grassland, I remember, and also beer bottles. <laughs> and, uh, and the whole field suddenly had something to work on. So the whole field of computer vision was working on Pascal v VOC data set, VOC data set. And I became an assistant professor, um, um, young junior faculty worried about tenure, but really want to do something. And that's when um, 
I start to go back to my root, which is cognitive neuroscience, and look at this 20 category, and I realize there's something wrong. Because a very important 1983 paper by a cognitive scientist called Irv Biederman, Irving Biederman says, humans recognize 30,000 categories by age six. And, and if he were right, it's an estimate, he didn't mean literally 30. If he were right, the whole field is working on 20. Something is not matching. And very serendipitously, um, I was on Princeton campus um, going through some interview process about to get that job. Very ser serendipitous, not by design, I ran into a linguist. And uh, her name is Christiane Frauben. I, I try to give names because there are real humans and human faces behind every scientific process. Christiane is a linguist uh, working in the psychology department. And um, for some reason, we started talking about semantics of pictures. And she said, Fifi, have you heard of WordNet? And I never did before that. That was 2006. And he, uh, she showed me, it turned out WordNet was constructed in the early 1990s by yet again another cognitive scientist, but in this case, linguist, George Miller, who says, it's stupid that we organize our concepts by alphabets. That's not how humans think about words and semantics, right? We don't, we don't go from apple to, what's the next word to apple? <laughs> On a, what? Uh, okay, <laughs> no, I mean uh, in a dictionary. <laughs> there must be an unrelated to fruit word next to apple. We don't oh, organize, yes. right, right, appliance or something. We don't organize it that way. We organize apple with pear and dogs with cats. And, and all that. So he created a massive ontology of English lexicons. There are 80,000 nouns in, in uh, WordNet and uh, more than 10,000 verbs and, and, and all that. And then Christiane showed this to me. And I was just so struck. This is the closest thing I've ever seen related to the Biederman work that says humans have a, um, conceptual space of 30,000 objects. But what's even more re remarkable, Christiane said, Fefe, do you know we have an ImageNet project? But it failed. And I said, what is your ImageNet project? She said, we want it, you know, WordNet is very successful. It's become the bread and butter of natural language processing research. We want researchers to use this, but sometimes people don't know what this word means. And, and I hope you get to experience this today because WordNet is really weird. It has some very arcane words. And so we ask undergrad to take one picture and, and attach to each of these WordNet synset. And we call this the ImageNet project. But no undergrad wanted to do this. They just they get so bored and it's such a laborious work and we gave up. So, so a few months later, I moved to Princeton and my students and I, I, I it started to really gel in our head that um, something has got to fundamentally change. Our world, real human visual intelligence is, is evolved and developed in a world of massive data, massive conceptual space, while the whole field of computer vision is working on 20. And, uh, and also, just mathematically speaking, for those of you who come from machine learning background here, there's a serious overfitting and lack of generalization problem here. So um, if you know what I mean, if you don't, don't worry. <laughs> and we wanted to change that. We, we want to fundamentally reboot this concept. So all this coming together, um, I wanted to take WordNet and, and, and the current search engine technology to create this massive data set that would drive machine learning in a different direction. So I went to Christiane, I said, is someone still doing ImageNet? She said, no. I said, I really like that name. Can I, I showed her my, my research plan. I said, can I just borrow that name? Can, can you give me that name? So I'm not credited in this name image that Christiane and her, her undergrads or whatever 
Um, she said, of course, just take it. It's not trademarked or anything. Um, um, just, um, um, so that's the birth of ImageNet uh, project. And, um, and I was a young assistant professor. I didn't have funding. And people think I was crazy. And I, couldn't, I didn't even have a student. I was trying to hire some undergrads to, to do this. And um, um, there were only one thing that I knew is that now internet is very healthy and big. And we can download a lot of pictures from the internet to jumpstart ImageNet. But it turned out actually downloading a lot of images from the internet is not an easy thing. Search engines like Google actually turn you off after you download a thousand images. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I was in a computer science department. Of course, I go to a, com a, a fellow computer scientist and ask him, what's the trick? And he showed me dynamic IP trick. So, <laughs> so I didn't even know dynamic IP at that point. So we tricked Google at that point, uh, at that time. And, and we quickly also discover Flickr. And for us, for me at least, Flickr was way better than Google because Flickr is citizen photography. And it really, in our mind, represents the world seen through uh, people's lens much better than Google. So we actually give more priority to Flickr pictures. Um, in the meantime, um, senior colleagues in the field are starting to recommend me not to do image that because it sounds like a career suicide for a, uh, a junior faculty. I, I remember one of my most, to this day, he's my, my dearest colleague and, and senior mentor saying to me, you know, Fefe, you need to grow with the field. Don't do something too disruptive. We're still working on 20 categories. Um, so uh, I actually take all of his advice except this one. So um, somehow, I maybe it's through my cognitive neuroscience background. Maybe it's we know this this is going to change, disrupt the way machine learning will go. And we're very determined. And then enter the most important person in ImageNet. I think history really need to remember him for is my former student, Jia Den. He was a second year PhD student at Princeton, uh, searching for his you know, um, PhD work. And to this day, Jia and I, I don't think I convinced him he was on an important project when he joined the ImageNet because, um, but he trusted me. He just said, well, I don't know what you're doing, but I'll do, <laughs> I will go through this with you at least for the first, uh, f and I, I really to this day appreciated that imagining a, a um, underfunded junior faculty onto a crazy idea that nobody even know what this is with a PhD student who didn't fully see what's coming, but it's that kind of trust that he gave me that really enabled the, 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 the work of ImageNet. But quickly we ran into a problem because we were hiring Princeton undergrads to label pictures, $10 per hour, I remember, very expensive. But they were so slow. I mean, we downloaded, we were in the process of downloading a billion images. And then they were, you know, they were labeling 100 to 200 per day. And, and Jack calculated he'll be there for 19 years <laughs> for his PhD. And he's like, okay, we've got to do something here. So we said, well, you know, computer vision is still advancing. Maybe we'll just use machines to label these images. So we start doing completely going the opposite direction and start using machines to label these one billion <coughs> images from search engines. But quickly find machines were giving us garbages because the best machines at that time were trained on 20 objects. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Our whole goal is to change machine vision. How could we use the crappy machines at the time to do this. So we're like, oh my God, we're stuck. So we, we dabbled on other ideas. I'll just skip that they, they, they quickly became um, wrong. 2007, I think it was January, I was walking the hallway. <laughs> and um, at that time, at least on the fourth floor of Princeton Computer Science Department, people know we were doing ImageNet, but people know we don't know what, what we're stuck. I met a 
master student who just came from Silicon Valley. And he said, Fifi, I heard there is a thing called Amazon Mechanical Turk. There was a startup company I saw in Silicon Valley that was using this online worker platform to label colors or some, some random things. I've never heard of this at that time. And by the time I went to my office, went to Amazon Mechanical Turk, I still remember, I still have goosebumps on me thinking about it. that was the moment I knew image that would happen. Because this is a global market of online workers we've never seen before. And for the next two and a half years, we employed about 50,000 global workers from 167 countries and helped us to label billions of images and got us uh, ImageNet. Uh, even though I couldn't get into the details, the engineering ingenuity, it, remember this is very, very early. Amazon just rolled out AMT services. No one knew what's, what's, how to deal with this in a massive scale. If it were not just persistency, his brilliance in his system building capability, his deep technical capability, this would not happen. Ja is the hero of this whole process. Of course, I was there with him, but it's his blood and sweat that for the, for the next two and a half years. And in 2009, ImageNet was published. For those of you who are coming from uh, academia um, would know what, what, what it means. It's published as a poster. So a very lowly, <laughs> you know, um, insignificant position in, in the um, top computer vision uh, conference called CVPR in, in Florida. I remember my students at that time, Jia and the whole team of students, were so eager to get people to take a look at ImageNet that we ordered some ImageNet pens. We customized ImageNet pens and start handing them out to bright people at the conference. So I think uh, I still have two of those pens. Whoever has ImageNet pens, you might want to save it for a few more years. <laughs> and, uh, and, but even at that conference, I remember my colleagues was questioning the use of this. And remember, GPU didn't happen. Nothing happened. Like, there were CPUs running really slowly. My colleagues were saying, what are you doing this for? We couldn't even put this on a hard drive. And uh, we couldn't even solve one category or the 20 categories. But um, we knew this will be important. So 2009 in the fall, um, I was in a train from Tokyo to Kyoto to attend the next important uh, conference in computer vision called ICCV. And I was talking to another computer vision researcher called Alex Berg. He was a Berkeley <coughs> PhD student and just become also an assistant professor, I think at that time at Stony Brook uh, uh, University. And he and I were talking about ImageNet and I was kind of expressing my frustration that we need more people working on this. This is really important. And then he said, Fefe, why don't you do what Pascal VOC did? did? Why don't we do a challenge and benchmark this for the whole world? And that train ride, I remember, was, I don't know, two hours. We, were, we talked for two hours, and we knew that that would be an idea we wanted to do. And I also want to thank, immediately I got in touch with the British researchers, Andrew Sisman, um, John Wing, Chris, a uh, guy okay. No, no, Bishop, the guy from Williams from Edinburgh. And, um, and also, um, uh, uh, tragically, um, the most important person for Pascal is Mark Abraham. He um, tragically died a few years later. But at that time, as soon as I contacted them, they were very welcoming to us. They said, doing a challenge at this scale is really difficult. You don't have much expertise. Let us help you. You, ImageNet will become a track to the Pascal VOC challenge in 2020, 20, uh, 2010 to, to, for you to take off. So if it were not the support 
and the welcome and the, the intellectual input of these international researchers, ImageNet Challenge wouldn't take off so fast in 2010. And, uh, and another hero in my world entered the picture by 2010 is my former PhD student, Olga Rusakovsky. She was a junior PhD student at Stanford. I moved to Stanford at that time, and she took on the entire task of setting up ImageNet Challenge starting 2010. And a lot of uh, the work you guys will see today um, is really her blood and sweat. 2010, um, about 15 international teams participated in ImageNet Challenge. 2011, similar number. 2012 was a special year. Um, well, first of all, that year my son was born. So, so I was on maternity leave and, uh, and um, around September, we knew that we we're going to announce every year annually the result of ImageNet Challenge at a major computer vision conference. And that year, the major computer vision conference was, I think, September or October. I need to check the date, but around now in Florence, um, Italy. So two weeks before that, maybe late August, very late at night, I was home. I was mostly on my maternity leave. I got a phone call from Olga and Ja, and they said, ImageNet Challenge results this year are in, and there's one team, the results really is remarkable. And we have done a lot of check, made sure that result was valid, and it's using an old algorithm called convolutional neural network. And it's an algorithm that um, computer vision field was not focusing on. Um, it's an algorithm that has made progress in digit recognition for many years, but just didn't make much uh, progress in, in um, object recognition. We were working on base nets and support vector machines and boosting methods for, for object recognition. But this is a singular submission that beat everybody's results by a large margin. And uh, the next day I went into office and examined this. We knew history was made. And because of that, I blame, the to, blame them to this day because I wasn't planning to go to Florence, Italy to announce any results because I was on maternity leave. But because it was so important, I had to buy a last minute ticket to Florence and I was stuck in the middle seat in, economy, in coach class for like, I don't know how many hours. I remember because I was still nursing my son, I remember I was in the air longer that I literally flew to Florence, announced the results and flew back. So, so it was a torturous trip. But uh, we went to Florence, uh, Italy in September 2012 and announced together with Jeff Hinton's uh, team their winning result on ImageNet Challenge using convolutional neural network. And by December 2012, that team turned this paper into a NeurIPS um, submission called ImageNet Classification, a Deep Convolutional Neural Network um, Architecture, I think that's the title or framework. And that is for everybody, or maybe historians in the future, considered the beginning of the deep learning revolution. And this year, uh, Jeff Hinton and, and his colleagues, Yan Lekug and Joshua Benjo won um, the Nobel Prize of Computer Science, which is the Turing Award um, for that, uh, for that uh, technology. So ImageNet is very proud to be there as, as an important contributor to this deep learning revolution. So that is, um, Ja and uh, Olga did really well as PhD students after ImageNet. They both went on to become professors. Interestingly, this is not by design. They're both professors at Princeton, back to where ImageNet originated from. And uh, their work now has expanded way beyond ImageNet. Actually, Ja jokes with me that he doesn't even want to talk about ImageNet anymore because he's done so much more uh, interesting work. But um, that is pretty much the human story behind the creation 
of image that and 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 uh, to the point it made it helped the world of computer science and artificial intelligence to transform from a long winter everybody calls AI winter into a revolution that we're seeing. So the last two minutes, I just want to share with you that um, when I went enter the field of computer vision, when I created ImageNet, I didn't know this our work would be so important to shape the future or collective future of our society. I went in as an intellectual curiosity, but by 2013, 2014, I woke up as a computer scientist realizing that this is bigger than all of us. AI will have such a huge impact to the day, to, to the daily lives of everyone, to the well-being, to the productivity. And uh, this is where, um, fast forward to, to, to now, I feel that the real, the, the next most important thing in our field is to recognize the human dimensions of this, uh, this technology. As humanity has created a lot of technology from fire to electricity, to cars, to PC, but every piece of technology is a double-edged sword. Or you could put it in another way. There's no independent machine values. Machine values are human values. How we design, use, deploy these powerful technology like AI is really up to us from the, from the beginning. So AI is no longer just this weird little niche computer science discipline that a bunch of nerds crank up some um, codes and then send it to products and, and that's it. Um, it, ha it has uh, so much impact on all of us. So at Stanford right now, um, we have together with Stanford leadership created the Human Center <coughs> AI Institute um, this earlier this year. And I'm the co-director along with the philosopher um, in charge of this institute. And this institute is really built on the foundational belief that we, AI is no longer a computer science discipline. It's an interdisciplinary field that needs to be integrated with social science, humanities, arts, to, to really explore the human <coughs> impact and potential human benefits of this technology. If we don't do it now, we don't do it ethically, responsibly, we might create a lot of problems. And already we're seeing machine learning bias, privacy infringement, um, um, you know, geopolitical issues entangled with AI, and many uh, future of jobs. Um, and many of these are, 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 you know, a result of this technological transformation. So I'm gonna stop here and, uh, I don't know if I talk too long. <laughs> I, I would love to just have a chance to have a dialogue with you, with Alan, and uh, and once again, really humbled that we have a birthday celebration for ImageNet. So many of the heroes behind ImageNet are actually doing real work, so they're not here. <laughs> but uh, please remember um, uh, some of the names. I know I'm missing some. Um, actually, one name I really did miss, and I cannot miss. I do want to say that there is one senior professor at Princeton at the beginning of my career. His name is Professor Kai Lee. He's also a Lee, but not related to me because there are so many Lees. Um, he, has, he doesn't do artificial intelligence at all. But when I was starting Image that project, before I even met Jia, I was really like, I didn't have anything, no funding, no machines. Kai heard my vision. I don't know if he believed it or, or not, but he gave me the first machines. He, gave, he recommended me to talk to Jia, who was about to become his student. And, and as a professor, you know, giving someone your own student is a huge gesture, a gesture of generosity. And without Kai, I wouldn't have jump-started this. So please remember these names, Kai, Jia, Olga, Cristiani, and, and, and the British um, um, you know, um, researchers, these are the true heroes of, of ImageNet. Thank you. Thank you.